Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. You're watching a live interview with the Political Review. Uh, my name is Nicholas Lear, and I'm the managing editor of this publication. I have the honor and privilege today of introducing to you His Excellency President Woodney Tolasius Johannesson, the sixth and current president of Iceland. President Johannesson is an historian by background and formerly a docent at the University of Iceland during which time he wrote about areas of modern Icelandic history, such as the Cods Wars and the 2008 to 2011 Icelandic financial crisis. He became Iceland's youngest ever president in 2016 and has enjoyed the highest approval ratings on record in Icelandic presidential history. Uh, and he was also re-elected in June this year when he secured 92% of the popular vote. President Johannesson, it is an honor to speak with you today. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Good morning. Good morning to you. Um, President Johannesson, as I mentioned just then in my introduction, you are an historian by training, and indeed a part of your training took place at Oxford uh, when you were a master's student. Um, you have written about a range of topics, including the Icelandic presidency, uh, which uh, demonstrated great prescience to your later career. Looking back on your time as an academic and as someone that regularly uh, appeared on Icelandic television discussing past presidents, did you ever anticipate that one day you would join their ranks? And crucially, how has being an historian shaped the way that you approach your job? Yeah, well, to begin with, no, I did not foresee or plan or intend mm -hmm. or even dream about becoming uh, a president, and it's a tremendous honor uh, every day. There's a scene, closing scene in a movie, The uh, Candidate, uh, where Robert Redford, the main actor, is elected, and uh, at the end of that journey, he says to himself and and people around him, "Well, what do we ne do next?" And that was kind of the feeling I. Uh, had uh, at the end of the campaign in 2016 because uh, the uh, events leading up to my candidacy and election were uh, fast moving, fast paced and uh, really uh, did not, uh, I, I wasn't really uh, planning on this and then, then uh, things took this turn and you just, you know, when there's an opportunity ahead of you, you you're faced with the question, do you want to continue down the safe road or try something new? Uh, I had yeah. just finished the long journey from uh, part-time lecturer to, uh, to full-time lecturer and then full-time professor. I was professor for one month. And then, you know, you decide, all right, I'm going to take this, uh, this turn in my life. Yeah. But uh, as you mentioned, yes, I, uh, in my academic career, I focused on, among other things, uh, the presidency here in Iceland. So for mm -hmm. me to become then president was almost like uh, stepping into your favorite TV program and becoming one of the characters or players in the, in the, in the, in the whole thing. Like, I don't know, House of Cards or, or maybe not House of Cards, but some, some other, some other uh, 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 program. Mm. But the, the thing you mentioned about uh, being a historian and then becoming president, it's a fascinating thing, actually. And you take with you uh, a experience. Uh, I, for one, felt that uh, it was useful to have been in uh, academia, to have worked as a, as a, as a historian. You uh, write lectures, you stop doing that, you write speeches instead. Mm. You deliver lectures to students. You stop doing that. You give speeches instead. It's, it's a, it's a similar ground. And when it comes to uh, uh, using this office for good, as as mm. you know, what to do, uh, I uh, I have been conscious of the fact that um, history is a powerful tool in mm. uh, contemporary debates, and. Um, I have, in uh, my work, tried to emphasize the uh, fact that uh, statespersons mm. now and before have 
been tempted to use or even abuse history for uh, their own contemporary agenda. And I want to warn against that. I want to uh, uh, make people aware that uh, when uh, heads of state and when politicians claim that history demonstrates this or that, they're mm. usually saying, I think that history demonstrates this or that. And when they say that uh, history shows that we must be united, they're usually uh, giving a very simple picture of what actually happened. So uh, I, this is something I have tried to use, my uh, background and my knowledge of history, mm. and, and try to be, of course, for good in that regard. Yeah. Um, President Johannesson, discussing then um, your own experience of uh, elections and using your background in elections, when you ran for office in 2016, you said that you wanted to be a less political president. Uh, that connects to what you've just discussed with uh, your background as, as an historian. Uh, you had, of course, never been affiliated with any of Iceland's political parties before. And since being elected in June 2016, you have enjoyed incredible, incredible uh, approval ratings at as high as 97% at one point. And, uh, do you see yourself as an example of how non partisanship can unify a nation? Yeah, well, thank you for mentioning those 97%. It's uh, actually when you take also the uh, non decideds into account and so on and so forth. And traditionally, uh, Icelandic presidents have enjoyed nationwide support. Uh, I know that you know, but the uh, most who are watching must also be reminded that the office of president in Iceland is not like, say, the office of president in the U.S. or or in France or in many other countries where the president plays a political role on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not the case over here. It's a mixture, yes, to be sure. The president can and must enter the political arena at certain times, but... Mm -hmm. um, your average day is not filled with question on 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 politics, as it were. So uh, it's a combination of a uh, of a uh, uh, sort of ceremonial head of state and a head of state with political duties. So that should explain why myself and uh, those presidents uh, before me have enjoyed uh, usually wide uh, national. Uh, support. But uh, I, in 2016, yes, uh, felt that uh, uh, what I would offer would be someone who would be outside the political arena, outside the business world as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that seemed to be appealing to the voters then, as it was uh, in the elections uh, this uh, last summer. Mm -hmm. Well, we talk about the elections uh, which just took place in June, as you say. Um, there were other democracies uh, elections uh, during this pandemic, as we know, in the Atlantic Ocean. And absentee voting is also important for your election. Um, and I want to ask you, the only other candidate in that election, uh, Lord Mondora Franklin Johnson, he, he advocated for the president to be uh, a more active participant in politics by exercising the rights of veto legislation. Um, I wanted to ask you, would you ever exercise that right? Uh, and in what circumstances perhaps would that be? Yeah, I would. And I uh, uh, emphasize that in the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, we um, have this uh, system or this provision in our constitution that the president can uh, decide not to ratify or confirm uh, laws passed by the parliament, the Althingi, mm. and then uh, the law takes effect still, but there will be a national referendum. So mm. my take on this is that uh, if I'm presented with a law that I just cannot uh, sign due to my beliefs or conviction, mm. uh, I will not do so. Uh, furthermore, if a uh, sizable part of the population demonstrates it their desire to have the final say, uh, mm. most likely with a petition, then the president, uh, whoever that is at any given moment, is uh, 
uh, not constitutionally obliged, but uh, politically or morally obliged to, to seriously consider that uh, uh, request. So that is how I have uh, looked at that. Um, during my tenure, I have not been uh, presented with uh, uh, petitions where a sizable part of the population has requested a referendum. Mm -hmm. So I have not had to tackle that issue in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. uh, however, if, uh, if I'm faced with such a demand, I would have to take that into serious consideration. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that the veto has only been used right only three times yeah. in Icelandic presidential history, and it's largely been uh, in relation to the ice save dispute. There were there were two occasions in in in, in which the veto was used there. I wanted to ask you about that episode uh, in Icelandic history um, because, of course, you have written extensively about the Icelandic financial crisis, and that was a very interesting episode. There were two referenda. You were talking about. Yeah. Referenda just then, uh, two referenda used by your predecessor. Um, do you think that that uh, President uh, Grimson was right to to call those referenda, uh, or would you have done things differently in handling that dispute? Well, I would I would never have been president uh, at that time, <laughs> and uh, actually, I don't think I would have wanted to be president at that time. Yeah, and my predecessor was uh, faced with. Uh, difficult task. Uh, I think uh, there is a consensus here in Iceland that he uh, uh, took the right decisions uh, mm -hmm. in those difficult uh, moments. Uh, there was a uh, there was a time when uh, the Icelandic government uh, wanted to and decided to uh, enter an agreement with the UK and the Netherlands, but mm -hmm. ultimately uh, the issue was solved in Iceland's favour by a ruling uh, by the EFTA court, the European Free Trade Association court, yes. and in the end the assets of the uh, bank in question, the Landsbanki, uh, mm -hmm. sufficed to, um, to cover the deposit in question. But. Uh, uh, previously, before that, there had been one referendum in 2004 where my predecessor, President Grimson, uh, decided not to uh, sign a law on uh, on media, and then the Parliament decided to uh, withdraw the law in question, and it led to debates about whether the president should have this right, uh, and uh, I think that question has been resolved once and for all. Uh, by and large, because of the situation during the uh, ISAF dispute, mm -hmm. and because that because the uh, political parties in Iceland now are more or less agreed on uh, wanting a provision in the constitution on uh, a referendum, so that a certain number of voters can uh, request a referendum on a law passed by parliament. The debate uh, is on how many should be behind such a request. Should it be 10% of the voters or even less? 15, 20%? Should there be a, a number on people participating? Should it be an added majority? And so on and so forth. And this has been one of the uh, issues uh, widely discussed in connection with the uh, uh, planned revision of the constitution of Iceland, which is a big issue. Mm. Well, on the on the subject of, of ISAFE, just again, do you think that that episode triggered an almost Brexit, dare I say, like wave of nationalism or populism in opposition to the way that uh, the government was handling negotiations with the UK and the Netherlands? Uh, and and has, has that all settled down now, in your opinion? Well, we're all good friends now, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The uh, government at the time, uh, the Gordon Brown regime uh, mm -hmm. decided to uh, use the so-called anti-terrorist legislation to mm -hmm. uh, freeze assets of Landsbanki and mm -hmm. at one stage also other assets. And this caused, uh, well, a furor in Iceland. And you had people demonstrating with placards saying, you know, we are not terrorists. So uh, bad blood. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, there was a feeling of bad blood then. 
mm-hmm. uh, and um, uh, memories of the so-called court wars between Iceland and Britain uh, were uh, recalled. So uh, there was, uh, of course, a feeling of uh, uh, displeasure against the outsiders, and that connects mm-hmm. with uh, what you can describe as a rise uh, of populism in Europe. But I don't mm-hmm. think you can uh, you can see uh, a rise of populism in Iceland in the term you use to describe developments in other parts of, of Europe. We have not uh, witnessed developments uh, here in Iceland similar to developments in, in some parts of Eastern Europe, for instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's, that's a fair point to make. just want to ask one final question, uh, President Johansson, on the subject of the financial crisis. And, that's because Iceland was hit particularly severely. In fact, I think The Economist has characterized the banking collapse as the worst ever relative to the size of your country in, in economic history. Um, has the banking system fully recovered and is it better placed to handle any future crisis? Yeah, mm-hmm. we are a small nation. Uh, we like uh, the fact when uh, we set some kind of world records, but I guess the world record of bankruptcy is not the one we uh, are particularly proud of. Uh, But the economy recovered uh, remarkably quickly and remarkably well. There's a number of factors, uh, good fishing seasons, Mm -hmm. but also uh, a tourist boom we experienced. You may remember that in uh, 2010, a massive volcanic eruption in Iceland disrupted all flights all traffic flights in Europe. And I remember we felt here in Iceland, all right, we're just doomed now. We have just had this huge banking collapse, which uh, had ramifications in other countries as well. And now we have a volcanic eruption that's uh, leaving people stranded in airports around the world. Nobody will want to see us again. Nobody will like us ever again. (laughs) And... uh, there was, unfortunately, and you see this with the benefit of hindsight, uh, too much feeling of sort of negativity in mm. Iceland. Uh, but as it turned out, this volcanic eruption in the uh, uh, underneath the uh, glacier Eyjafjallajökull, uh, and try to pronounce that, uh, was a well, I guess you can call it a blessing in disguise because no lives were lost. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we recovered quickly from the, uh, from the uh, uh, damage of ash uh, in, in the countryside. It, people, all of a sudden, everybody seemed to know where Iceland is and people flocked to Iceland. And uh, tourism uh, in a number of years grew into being one of the main pillars of the Icelandic economy. So uh, uh, up to the pandemic, Iceland was doing really well in economic terms. We had recovered, the banking system had uh, Mm. uh, been restructured, uh, and uh, you will never, I think, at least not in our lifetime, see an advertisement in the UK from an Icelandic bank promising great interest rates on uh, online accounts. We will, if we don't learn from history, at least in our generation, then 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 you know, then there's reason to be gloomy. So we were on the right track. We had recovered, and then of course uh, we were hit by the pandemic, just like everyone else. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, uh, our reco- economic recovery had been such that we are uh, in a good position to uh, survive the pandemic, and. Uh, yeah. Now we're cautiously optimistic, of course, that uh, with a vaccine, uh, mm-hmm. we, will, we will quickly uh, rebound in the tourism industry. And mm-hmm. uh, uh, then, you know, then uh, tourists will again flock to Iceland. And mm-hmm. The waterfalls and the geysers and the, all the rest of it that, uh, you know, Iceland has not changed in that regard. Yeah, well, that, that's very interesting. I was going to ask you about the impact on, on tourism, but that you've answered my question already. I have one final question then on the 
domestic economy, really. You know, the question related to Icelandic banks and businesses, if you take the example of Wow, uh, the airline, which folded last year, it seems that Icelandic businesses have a tendency to really uh, grow very, very quickly and then bust quite quickly as well. And why do you think that is? Well, the Icelandic banking system was, uh, well, was mostly uh, state-run and heavily regulated until the early uh, years of the uh, twenty uh, of the twenty-first century. So, so the banks had survived in that uh, environment for decades. Uh, I, traditionally, uh, Icelandic the Icelandic economy has been heavily uh, reliant on, on fisheries and fisheries fluctuate, patches fluctuate. You have a good season, you have a bad season. And the yeah. economy uh, was uh, uh, marked by that. You know, there's a, ten, you, you, there's a saying in Icelandic, the herring comes and the herring goes. And mm. it's difficult to, to manage an economy in, in those circumstances. Mm. So. Uh, Maybe it has uh, affected our national character somehow. I, I don't like expressions of national character. Uh, character. I think they're overly simplistic and uh, often or usually or always misleading. But we have a saying here in Iceland, things will work out somehow. Maybe that accounts for uh, this... Uh, uh, this boom and bust cycle we have yeah. uh, apparently uh, experienced here in Iceland. But then again, you know, you mentioned uh, the airline that uh, went bankrupt here in Iceland. Uh, we look at our friends and neighbors, the Norwegians, and we say that they are always overly cautious and takes them about a year or so to reach a decision on anything. But, you know, the last airline I heard about filing for bankruptcy was Norwegian. So I'm not, you know, it's not uh, the difficulties in the airline industry are not only tied to Iceland in the Nordic region or elsewhere. No, absolutely. It's a particularly difficult time right now. Um, yeah, exactly. if, if we move on to um, discussing uh, Icelandic society uh, more generally, um, Iceland is in many ways a, a model country for progressive. It has strong social cohesion, very high levels of education, very high levels of gender equality in the workplace. Indeed, Iceland became the first country in the world to, to legally enforce equal pay. Um, how has Iceland achieved such incredible success in these respects? Yeah, well, as head of state, it's uh, wonderful to get a question like this. How come you're so brilliant? How come you're so great? And uh, it's tempting to say, well, thank you very much. It just must be that we're just better than the rest. But that would not be, that would not be a fair answer. Uh, there are many things we can do so much better here, and we must be yeah. cautious not to rest on our laurels, as it were. But yes, you're right. Mm. Uh, gender equality is uh, is great here in Iceland. We've we've mm. moved further uh, on that road than than uh, most other countries. We've topped the gender equality index, uh, yeah, the World Economic yeah. Forum index for eleven years now, I think. Wow. So uh, there's one statistic we love. Uh, I would say in the most simple terms that the smallness of this nation is our asset in this regard. Mm. We know that in hard times, we have to stick together. We know that uh, uh, we cannot afford to leave, when, if you take the gender issue, one part of the population in a worse position than the, than the, than the other part. Mm. Of course, it still works to be done, but this is the, the sentiment which behind our uh, uh, emphasis on gender equality. Furthermore, I think there is this feeling in society in general that we should allow each individual to demonstrate her or his worth, mm -hmm. to show what they're capable of, to give everyone a good opportunity uh, to determine, to, de to show your best. Uh, so we want to have an education system and a healthcare system where it doesn't matter if your parents are rich or poor, or mm. yourself are rich and poor. Uh, is, if if you are rich or if you are poor, you just yeah. get the service you need and require. 
At the same time, we want to have this safety net. But if you need assistance, you will get assistance. So we have this combination of individual spirit and individual drive coupled with a, a strong welfare system and this ethos that we're in this together. Yeah. So this, I think, uh, is the foundation for a society of progress, tolerance, mm. and freedom. Yeah. Well, I certainly think that Bob Nelson is a success story. I won't mention the successes in the football in 2016 against oh, England. I was there in 2016 in Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we forget about that. Um, <laughs> now, President Janison, um, as Iceland's head of state, uh, where do you see your country's place in the world right now? I see Iceland uh, as a strong, uh, democratic state, mm -hmm. uh, campaigning for uh, liberty, freedom, justice. Uh, fighting inequality, oppression, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, poverty. Uh, we can be uh, a model for other countries mm -hmm. if we uh, add the uh, necessary provision that we are not, you know, paradise on earth. If we are, if we are humble and modest when we point out what we have done well. Uh, we are situated where we are, in the middle of the North Atlantic. Uh, so mm -hmm. that will always affect our uh, uh, relationship with the outside world. We need to have a strong and healthy relationship with our neighbors in the Nordic countries, in the Arctic region, in mm -hmm. Europe. North America, but we also need to uh, reach further. Uh, the world is a global village now, uh, so uh, we need to emphasize, emphasize uh, uh, good relations when it comes to trade, for instance, uh, with, with, the whole, uh, with the whole world. Again, I should emphasize that as head of state, I do not uh, represent the government of Iceland. We have a prime minister and a cabinet. And sometimes when I am doing interviews like this, it's almost like the game I play with my kids where uh, they ask a question and you're not allowed to answer with a yes or a no or black and white and so on and so forth. So, so yeah. I have to be careful not to <clears throat> give the impression that I am actually speaking for the government of Iceland or mm -hmm. uh, or to uh, say something which contradicts or uh, mm -hmm. goes against what the government of Iceland at the time is, uh, is uh, championing. Mm. No, of course, I understand that. And I want to ask you about um, Iceland's relationship with the European Union uh, at this point. Okay, that's, a question, yeah. that's a question where I have to be careful. Yeah. <laughs> No, well, I, I won't, I'll come. I'll come on to, to the Brexit a little later. But just, just wanted to ask. Yeah. Um, obviously, Iceland did apply to join the EU in two thousand and nine. Uh, it then subsequently resigned from that position. Um, and generally, opinion polls in the last few years have been opposed to starting accession negotiations. Uh, so, do you think that EU membership is not a question right now? Well, I don't think I'm treading on. Uh thin ice if I were to say that the European Union is in a state of flux right now. It's true. Uh, and I don't think I'd be uh, uh, sort of ruffling any feathers if I say that uh, there has been a constant majority in Iceland in recent years against uh, EU membership. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question for the uh, political parties and the population in Iceland to mm -hmm. uh, trust and debate and it remains to be seen we have parliamentary elections uh, uh, planned for next year and uh, uh, let's see how much uh, the European Union will figure in those uh, in those uh, elections uh, at the end of the day here just like everywhere else you will never join the European Union without a national referendum. 
Mm-hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, it's not one of the uh, biggest issues facing the nation of Iceland right now. Yeah. You said that you would never join the European Union without a national referendum. Well, it seems that you'll never leave it without one either. And of course, we'll talk about Brexit now. Um, and I want to really ask because obviously you know that the transition period between the UK and the EU will, will come to an end at the end of this year. It doesn't look like there's a long term trading arrangement in place. Um, and that means that the EEA agreement uh, will no longer apply to the UK after the transition period. Are, are you worried about the impact of Brexit on Iceland at all? Well, I know that uh, the governments of Iceland and the UK and the officials have been in constant contact and uh, uh, agreements have been signed and everyone is determined to uh, maintain a good and healthy relationship between Britain and the UK no matter what happens between uh, Britain and, uh, and the European Union. Mm. So uh, the determination is there to make the best of any possible situation. So I'm not worried in, in that regard. We'll just have to see how things pan out between uh, Britain and, and Brussels. Uh, mm. As a historian and as someone who wrote his PhD dissertation on uh, fishing disputes between Britain and other countries uh, in the North Atlantic, I am uh, fascinated uh, by the uh, impact of fisheries actually in the Brexit negotiations and uh, uh, have uh, have uh, watched uh, news reports on that. And um, it brings to my mind, I wish I had written it down, but I remember mm. uh, Harold Macmillan, uh, yeah. Prime Minister in, in the late 50s and early 60s, saying after one of these disputes where Britain, as usual, lost ultimately, mm. uh, Macmillan said something on the lines of, well, public opinion in Britain is always sensitive about ruling the waves. You know, Britannia rule the waves. Anything that has to do with fish, anything that has to do with, uh, with the... Uh, Freedom of the high seas is very sensitive in Britain. And Mm. when I was writing my dissertation, I would have been able to say to myself, well, this is all history, but clearly uh, it's also a contemporary issue indeed. So we'll have to see what happens there if, uh, if, uh, if some, yeah, if, if the fish will be stuck in somebody's throat. Well, fishing is, as you say, is a very symbolic issue in, in Britain, uh, but it also actually accounts for a very small percentage of our national GDP. So yeah. it's, it's interesting how that issue will be will be managed. Just wanted to ask one final question, President Johansson, before we conclude this interview, and that relates to Iceland's energy and sustainability policy, um, which, uh, without flattering you again too much, has been heralded as, as a model for the world. Um, I think, you know, Iceland has the highest percentage share of renewable energy in the OECD. Um, But I want to ask you, um, how will you manage the tension between developing Iceland's energy capacity with the development of tourism, which you mentioned earlier, and the the need to preserve Iceland's fragile environment? Um, Yeah. It's one of the main questions uh, in Iceland now Mm -hmm. and for the foreseeable future. How do we successfully uh, be faithful to our determination to uh, protect uh, our nature, our interior uh, for future generations and at the same time be able to exploit our natural resources in a sustainable manner. I'm an optimist here. I believe that progress in in uh, how we can uh, use our resources uh, will benefit us. But mm. this is a tricky question. Uh, before Parliament now, there is a bill on uh, turning the interior of Iceland into a national park uh, mm. with all kinds of obligations resulting, including uh, uh, the issue of how you harness uh, hydropower or mm. if you harness hydropower. And the same goes with geothermal power. So uh, this is a big issue in in Icelandic discourse today and will remain so. But uh, 
we are blessed indeed. We are blessed with uh, geothermal. We are suffering uh, a wave of Arctic winds now bringing cold uh, air uh, southwards to, to the island. And uh, uh, we are asked to conserve now our, our hot water. But we can heat our homes here, like yeah. well over 95%, if I remember correctly, are of Icelandic homes or even more heated by uh, underground hot water and mm. it reminds me of my uh, days in the UK when I was doing my uh, my uh, undergraduate degree at uh, Warwick University yeah. and I rented this flat with um, with my three English students and they just would not they would not spend a penny on heating the flat <laughs> a penny that be used on 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 other necessities, shall we say? We'll so, say that. When I, <laughs> so when I complained about the desperate cold in the house, I mean, I had to write my essays with gloves on, and you know, oh. uh, they say like, "Come on, you're from Iceland, you win." So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we we are blessed here in Iceland with geothermal energy, and mm -hmm. that's actually one thing because you mentioned how we can. How we can uh, be of use in the world. We can export. We can, we can export our knowledge. We uh, mm -hmm. know how to harness geothermal energy, and uh, it's clean. It's green. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a good answer to the uh, to to the need in many parts of the world for cleaner energy. So, so uh, let's praise. Uh, uh, geothermal energy, especially here in Iceland now, as we're in this this cold Arctic blizzard. Well, that's a, a wonderful note to, to, to finish on. President Johansson, may I thank you so much for your time today. It's been an honour and a privilege to speak with you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and you know, stay safe. Absolutely, and thank you to everyone around the world for watching this interview. We hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.